I saw images of the earth from above. And you just realize how much is going on in the ocean, the variability that's there, the changes that are occurring. It really became a passion of mine to understand what's happening in the ocean. My name is Ben Hamilton, and I'm studying sea level rise from space. So sea level rise is really interesting because the impacts are local, but it's a global problem. So I've done a lot of work looking at sea level rise in particular locations, but on much broader scales and with the satellites, we have this global view. So here we can see the satellites orbiting the Earth and where they are right now. Having overlap between the different missions allows us to make a direct comparison. And it's really the information we gain from all of these satellites that tell us about sea level change and allow us to get an understanding of what's happening on an entire climate system. And that really long record that will exceed 30 years with the Sentinel-6 satellite allows us to have a better understanding of how the Earth's climate is changing. So this is an animation of the Sentinel-6 spacecraft and uh, how it collects information about about the, the sea surface. You can see the radar pulse that's bounced off the surface of the ocean. It measures the time it takes for that pulse to get back and from that we can pull out the measurement of sea surface height. It's not just scientific curiosity, it really impacts the daily lives of people and their ability to plan for their future. As I started to live in coastal areas and see flooding that was occurring, I got to see firsthand the effects of sea level rise and climate change you start to realize the importance of understanding what sea level is doing now. We can use that understanding to know what sea level might be doing in the future. Hi, I'm Raquel Villanueva with NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Southern California. Now, you may know NASA best for exploring other planets, but we are also keeping a close eye on our own planet Earth. NASA is about to launch the USN European Sentinel-6 Michael Freilich satellite. This satellite aims to collect the most accurate data yet on sea level and how it changes over time. JPL manages the Sentinel-6 Michael Freilich mission for NASA. Ben Hamilton is a research scientist here at JPL who is studying the rate at which the ocean is rising. And he joins us live today to answer your questions. If you have any questions you'd like to ask, you can leave them right here in the comments or post them to social media with the hashtag seeing the seas. Now, thank you so much for joining us today, Ben. Great. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to answer some questions about this great satellite mission. Great. Let's get started. So how will you use the data collected from the Sentinel-6 Michael Freilich satellite? So the satellite gives us a measurement of, of what we call sea surface height. So it measures the height of the ocean from space. And it's actually an incredible measurement that's being made. So from way up on orbit above uh, the ocean, we can get an, an idea of the height of the sea level to an accuracy of about one inch. So it's really an incredible measurement. And what we're able to do with this is really monitor how the ocean is changing on a wide range of time scales. So every 10 days or so, we get a complete uh, view of, of the global ocean from these, these satellites. And from that, we can identify how sea level is changing on these relatively short time scales. So on the order of, say, months to years. But then when you start to build up this satellite record, um, you can really start to infer or understand how sea level is changing on longer time scales. And why is it so important to study sea level? And can you get a little bit more into how it's done from space? And so as, as I mentioned in the video, sea level is, uh, the impacts of sea level rise are local. So we feel these on a local level, coastal communities are the ones that are really feeling the impacts of sea level rise. But sea level science and understanding sea level science is a global problem. The processes that are impacting, uh, that cause sea level to change are global in nature. So this really broad view of the ocean we have from satellites is critical to understanding how sea level is changing. Um, both now, um, using that understanding that we have now to understand how sea level is going to, to change in the future. So this observation comes from the satellite um, through a relatively simple concept. So the satellite sends a radar pulse down to the surface of the ocean. That radar pulse bounces off the surface of the ocean and uh, returns to the satellite. And we can measure the time it takes for that pulse to get to the ocean and return to the satellite. And from that, we can uh, figure out exactly how high the sea level is at any given time. And th that makes it sound a little bit easy. It's actually pretty complex, everything else that goes into that, that measurement, because as that radar pulse travels through the Earth's atmosphere and interacts with the ocean, a number of things happen to it. So it's delayed, the timing is affected. Uh, when it bounces off the surface of the ocean, the ocean is certainly not the same everywhere, so it interacts with the ocean surface in different ways. So we have to make all these different corrections to that observation or to that, um, that radar pulse and the timing in order to get to the accuracy that we actually have for the uh, for the satellite altimeter measurements. 
And then the other piece of that is we need to know very accurately where the satellite actually is. Um, that may seem like a, kind of a no-brainer, but at any given time, you really need to know where it is in reference to uh, to the ocean. So with all these different measurements um, and, and corrections we make, we eventually get to that sea surface height observation. And again, the accuracy that's down to about an inch all the way up from, from orbit uh, above the uh, surface of the ocean. Great, and then can you talk a little bit more about how changing sea levels impact coastal towns or cities in the future? Yeah, so there's a number of ways that um, sea, rising sea levels impact coastal communities. So one of these that has been in the news a lot lately is is through increased storm surge. So basically, you can treat the sea level rise that we've been seeing as an increase in the baseline over which these storms travel. So with higher sea levels in these coastal areas, a storm moves over top of it. And the storm surge that you feel from these hurricanes and larger storms is just that much greater than it was previously. The other way that we see the impacts of um, higher sea level is through something called high tide flooding. And what high tide flooding is, is really right there in the name. It's flooding that occurs at high tides. So these coastal communities were built knowing where high tide typically is. So many years ago, um, we built up these different areas expecting high tide to be in a certain place. And again, now with that increase in that foundation of sea level through long-term sea level rise, we've increased the height of high tide. So now what was uh, before um, a relatively safe high tide with no coastal flooding, now it doesn't really take much to get past that threshold from a normal high tide into flooding uh, conditions. Um, so sea level rises is already impacting these coastal, uh, coastal communities. It's a problem now, it's worsening, and uh, it's expected to worsen in the future. And more areas that aren't necessarily um, experiencing uh, coastal flooding or sea level rise impacts now likely will in the future as sea level continues to increase. And before this broadcast, we kind of talked about for how you had firsthand experience seeing this. So can you talk more about your personal journey that led you to this mission? Yeah, up until about two years ago, before I started working at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, I was living in coastal Virginia in a, a city called Norfolk, Virginia. And we, my wife and uh, family and I bought a house across the street from a coastal inlet. And a few times a year, we'd see that water come creeping across the neighbor's yard on the other side of the street into the road. Um, it was something that we really got to experience firsthand, the sea level rise um, impacts and the coastal flooding that some of these communities around the world are seeing. Um, so the, the flooding is not necessarily catastrophic, but it just becomes part of your day-to-day -day life. So it impacts your ability to get to work. Maybe you have to go a different route than you're used to. Um, it can impact where you park your car. Certainly, you don't want to keep your car parked in an area where uh, it might get flooded. Um, it's just something that you have to learn to adapt to and, and plan for as part of your everyday life. So, um, again, with this firsthand experience, um, I started to understand exactly what it meant to try to understand sea level and the importance of doing so. So, uh, as part of my time in, in Norfolk and these coastal communities, I had a, the chance to interact and work a lot with coastal planners and decision makers and understand their science needs. What do they really need in terms of information to make good plans for the future and to ensure these coastal communities are able to live uh, life successfully and happily into the future. Um, so taking that information, we can take it all the way back to the observations that we make from these satellites, understanding exactly what information they need, trying to improve our understanding now of, of what sea level is doing. And again, these satellites, including the Sentinel-6 Michael Freilich satellite, are critical to that, uh, that mission of trying to understand sea level rise now. And once we understand the processes that are driving sea level change now, we can use that understanding to uh, project out and to understand what might be happening to sea level in the future. Well, thank you for answering. Those are my questions, Ben. We're gonna to get to some social media questions now for you to answer. And the first okay, one, sounds good. It's from Moon to Mars on Twitter, and they are asking, will you be able to use any data from other NASA missions studying ice for your water measurement? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. So we have this whole observation network of, uh, of satellites and in situ observations that we use to understand sea level. So a lot of these satellites allow us to um, understand specific processes that affect sea level. So it's uh, although the altimeters measure total sea level or sea surface height, we like to try to understand exactly what processes, what physical processes are actually contributing to that change in sea surface height that we see. So just to name a couple of these satellites, the GRACE follow-on satellite, for instance, um, gives us really good measurements of the change in ice uh, over glaciers and uh, the ice sheets.
And from that, we know that the water, when it melts, it goes into the ocean. It gets distributed about the, the um, world's oceans in different ways. Uh, and then from that, we can make better sense of the observations we have from the satellite altimeters. Um, ISAT-2 is another example. ISAT-2 is actually capable of measuring sea surface height. It's a, a little bit of a different measurement than what we see from the radar altimeters from Sentinel-6 Michael Freilich, but it's complementary and it allows us to really understand how sea level is changing on different resolutions, so on different spatial scales, um, getting closer to the coast, understanding how sea level is changing very close to the coast. Um, and I, I obviously just named two satellites, but there's a whole, again, a whole network of observations that we rely on in addition to our satellite altimeter measurements to really understand what's happening um, in the ocean and, and happening in sea level change. And that actually kind of leads me into this next question from Cody on YouTube who asked, do you know how many of these Sentinel satellites will be deployed in orbit? Yeah, so um, in terms of this kind of core um, satellite altimeter mission, there's going to be this, the Sentinel 6A Michael Freilich, which we're discussing here. And in a few years, I think the anticipated launch date is 2025, we'll have the Sentinel 6B um, satellite altimeter, which is going to launch. And with this whole suite of satellite altimeters, so, so the first um, kind of modern era satellite altimeter was launched in 1992, it's the Topex Poseidon satellite. From there, we had Jason 1, Jason 2, Jason 3, and then on up to the Sentinel-6, um, 6, 6A Michael Freilich. So with this satellite, we're going to pass three decades in length. With Sentinel-6B, we're going to start to approach four decades in length. And that long, continuous record we have from the satellite altimeters is really important. Um, so with that long record, we can start to separate what might be natural oscillations in sea level from what might be um, the sea level rise associated with global warming or anthropogenic effects. So there's all these different signals that cause sea level to change on shorter time scales. Um, to, to name a few, uh, one in particular, El Nino is one that many have heard of. So El Nino can cause very large changes in the Pacific Ocean um, to occur on a year to year basis. Um, and we're interested in, and certainly interested in observing that, but we also want to separate that signal, those natural oscillations from longer term sea level rise. That's really critical from a planning perspective. We want to know what sea level might be many years into the future. So this long continuous record that we have from the satellite altimetry is really hugely important from a scientific perspective. Um, so it, yeah, again, to answer your question, those are kind of the next two in this, this train of, um, of modern altimeters. And how much data, how many years worth of data would you like to see personally come through? I mean, the, the longer we can keep this record going, the, the better. I mean, the, the easier these problems become scientifically. I've done a lot of work myself looking at tide gauges and trying to give context to the satellite record using tide gauges. Tide gauges are very difficult observations to use just because they're so sparse and they're obviously located on land. That's where tide gauges are located. So you get different effects that cause um, trends at those tide gauge locations. So it's a very difficult comparison to make, but these are active research efforts. And really the whole goal here is to try to understand how sea level has changed over as long a period as possible. So then when we're talking about our satellite record, um, we can give better context to it and understand the changes we're seeing now and how they differed from changes in the past. Now, if we have a nice long record from the satellite altimetry specifically, um, then we don't have to, to rely quite to the same extent on tide gauges and doing these harder studies. We can look directly at the satellite record. It's a very accurate observation. We have really good estimates of how sea level is changing both globally and regionally. And then we can uh, can use that again to understand what's happening now and then understand what's happening into the future. So to answer your question, as long as possible, if we could keep uh, keep this record going, I think it would be a great help scientifically. Thanks. And Robert and Tina on YouTube kind of have a follow up question for what I asked. Have past sea level records been compared to current ones? Yeah, so I, I touched on this a little bit. So a, a very active area of research is comparing um, tide gauge records to the satellite records. And we see from the, the satellite records and that comparison to the tide gauges that the rate of, of sea level rise on global scales has really increased compared to what we see what we have seen over the 20th century. So again, doing that comparison, we really do um, do understand how sea level is the, the era of sea level rise that we're in now is somewhat unique, at least in terms of the 20th century. There's other efforts, research efforts that go further back beyond the, the beginning of the 20th century. Um, I'm not necessarily an expert on those, so I won't speak to those directly, but there are a lot of different ways that we can take observations of the past and try to give context to what we see during the satellite era. And then Scott on YouTube has a different sort of question. He wants to know, 
will this same radar technology pick up any animal migration? Um, I'm not aware of it being used for uh, for animal migration. Uh, the um, effective spatial resolution of the satellite altimeters is not really uh, useful for for that kind of observation, for that kind of very, very fine scale um, observation. Some of the future um, altimeters, uh, there, there's one called the Surface Water and Ocean Topography Mission, which is coming up uh, in a few years. That's going to be much higher resolution observations of the um, of the ocean. Still not uh, not to the point where we'd see animal migration, but um, yeah, we we certainly do try to get as high a resolution observation as possible that allow us to see some of those smaller scale features. And then Dan on YouTube is asking, are you able to measure rising CO2 levels in the ocean? So not with um, the, the satellites that we typically have or the, the satellite altimeters that we've had over the, the past few years. So we rely on other complementary observations from other satellites in order to, to make this um, uh, make these observations uh, and to understand sea level. Um, the Sentinel 6A Michael Freilich satellite is um, a little bit different than the past satellites. It is making additional observations, including some observations of the, the atmosphere. Um, so it, it is providing additional detail beyond what we had in the other satellite missions. Again, that's a little outside there, my area of expertise where I focus predominantly on sea level. Thanks for trying to answer that. And Elizabeth on okay. YouTube is asking, are you looking mostly at coastal sea levels or are areas far from land also of interest? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So uh, maybe, maybe it goes back to what I said earlier that the impacts of sea level rise are, co are local and coastal. So obviously we're very concerned about the sea level signal that gets expressed at the coast, how sea level is rising at the actual coast, because that tells us something about how these coastal communities are gonna be impacted into the future. But the processes that affect sea level rise are really large scale. Um, a lot of them are very large scale. Um, so again, uh, as an example, El Nino, for instance, that's really a Pacific Ocean basin wide um, effect that causes sea level rise um, uh, on very, very large scale. So um, we, we really need to have this very big global view of the ocean that these satellites provide in order to understand the processes and how that gets communicated to, to the coast. So um, our, our view of sea level and our study of sea level is really global in nature. And then we do whatever we can to take that global view and that global understanding and translate it to what's actually happening at the coast. Now, Michael on YouTube is asking for a very specific location. Does the satellite data include the Great Lakes? Yes, so we do have some observations over the Great Lakes. Um, I can't necessarily speak to those. Uh, I, I haven't looked at them myself, but the satellites uh, the, and the altimeters, there is a, a certain amount of work being done uh, looking at, at the Great Lakes. Um, again, as we go forward into some of the future missions, the SWAT mission, for instance, um, and so, some of the other future satellites that we're launching, um, we're going to get much better views of some of these inland um, uh, water bodies. That's great. And Forza Jersey on YouTube is asking, how long do our coastal cities have to adapt? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. I mean, it, it's somewhat a, of a case-by-case -case basis. I mean, for, for example, Norfolk, where I lived previously, people are still living very happily in, in Norfolk. I mean, I, I'm certainly not a, a doom and gloom um, a representation of life in Norfolk. Um, in these coastal communities, people often live there because they like the water. So it's, it's a matter of trying to understand how to adapt and still successfully live with that water going forward. Um, that being said, the adaptation strategies for a city like Norfolk, for instance, are not gonna be the same for other areas. Um, in other areas, you may have to talk about coastal migration. So moving away from the coastline uh, or uh, sorry, migration moving away from the coastline. Um, it's it's not a one size fits all answer to that. Um, with the satellites, we actually do get a good view of how sea level rise varies regionally. So again, it's not equal everywhere. Some areas are experiencing sea level rise at faster rates than others. As an example, so in the Western tropical Pacific, some of those low lying islands, over the past three decades, they've seen very high rates of sea level rise. We've measured those with the altimeters. On the other hand, off the U.S. West Coast, we've seen lower uh, than the global average sea level rise. So it's been kind of suppressed by different climate signals that are that are um, present in the ocean. Um, so again, that's it's it's hard to answer that question. Um, certainly, there's local planners. the The planning efforts are done on a local level, trying to understand how to adapt to um, the the sea level rise they may see in the future. Thanks. And then we have a last question here from. Ramirez on Facebook, who is asking, will the satellites measure the average 
or instantaneous values of water height? And can they predict storms and tsunamis? Yeah, so um, th those are those are good questions. So the satellites fly over overhead and they basically take a measurement directly below the satellite at any given time. So we're constantly taking these observations, these measurements. Over 10 days, we can build these up to have a global map. So we still have some space between the tracks along which the satellites are measuring. Um, so um, again, over time, we can build up this measurement. And what we can do is average these observations that are taken at an instant in time, and then try to get an understanding of how the ocean is changing over longer time scales. So um, there's an important metric that we call global mean sea level. We take all these observations every 10 days, we average them together, and we have a single measurement for the ocean. And you stack these up over time, and you get an idea of how global sea level is changing um, over, over the, the satellite record. So the rate of global mean sea level change is a little over three millimeters per year since 1992. So we can make that measurement by stacking up and averaging all these, these instantaneous measurements. Um, in terms of storms and tsunamis, so yes, we can certainly use our observations from the satellites for both of those. Um, actually, one of my uh, PhD topics, one of my thesis topics, was trying to observe tsunamis in the open ocean using altimeters. It's a little bit of a difficult problem given all the other types of ocean signals that are there, but we can see these types of features in the ocean. And certainly, um, Sentinel 6A Michael Freilich is going to be useful for um, helping to forecast and understand the development of storms and hurricanes in the ocean. Great. Thank you so much, Ben. That's all the time we have for questions today. And thank you for everyone online who submitted their questions. Thanks for being on the show. Thanks for yeah. having me. Of course. The Sentinel-6 Michael Freilich satellite is truly an international collaboration. It is being jointly developed by the European Space Agency, NASA, the European Organization for the Exploitation of Meteorological Satellites, and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, with funding support from the European Commission and technical support from the French space agency, CANES. Now, the Sentinel-6 Michael Freilich satellite is scheduled to launch on November 10th. And for the latest on the mission, follow at NASA Earth on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. You can watch all the behind the spacecraft video profiles on the NASA 360 YouTube channel. And we will be doing Q&As with Sentinel-6 Michael Freilich satellite team members each Wednesday afternoon. So please follow and subscribe for those notifications. And at NASA Earth Science, your home is our mission. Thanks for watching.